Have you ever noticed that after a while you stop seeing your own clutter? It's like your brain turns a blind eye to it, making it blend into the background almost. This phenomenon isn't a sign that you're ignoring the mess on purpose. It's actually the result of your brain's selective attention. Imagine how unproductive we would be if we took notice of every single thing around us all the time. Your brain is constantly striving to conserve energy and to conserve resources. And one of the ways that it does that is by filtering out important information from what it deems as unimportant information. The brain's gatekeeper for information is something called the reticular activating system. This is a bundle of nerves in the brainstem that acts as a filter. It decides what information passes through and what gets ignored and pushed to the background. The RAS is constantly working to help you focus on what's important and block out the rest so that you're not overwhelmed by sensory overload. Now, of course, the RAS is more complicated and it does much more than just filtering out our clutter. It's actually essential to several critical functions, such as wakefulness and sleep, or what they call arousal and consciousness. It plays a pivotal role in waking you up from sleep and maintaining alertness, and it helps you to maintain your sleep-wake cycle so that you stay awake and focused during the day and you get sleep at night. When they separated this part of the brain from the rats, the rats were unable to sleep at all. It also plays a factor in motivation and goal setting. It's involved in goal-oriented behavior specifically. So when you set a goal, the RAS helps you to notice opportunities and resources that could help you to achieve that goal. It helps to keep you motivated, focused, and on track. But it also plays a role in attention and focus. By filtering sensory information, like the clutter that's in your visual field of sight, the RAS allows you to concentrate on specific tasks or stimuli. Whether you're reading a book in a noisy cafe, or you're focusing on a conversation in a crowded room, it can help you to tune out irrelevant distractions. And that's what we're really talking about today. So as your brain adapts to the presence of clutter, it starts to filter it out, making it less noticeable over time. This adaptation can lead to a kind of clutter blindness where you collect more stuff without necessarily realizing it or without realizing it until it all comes to a head and you're overwhelmed already. The clutter becomes a part of the background noise and before you know it, you're surrounded by things that you no longer even see. This is something that I did touch on in the video, what psychologists know about your clutter that you don't. So if you're interested in more subjects like this, I recommend you check that out after this video. But how do we overcome clutter blindness? How do you break the cycle and bring your attention back to the clutter, making it become visible to you again? Well, the key is to intentionally draw your focus to your surroundings. And so today I'm going to share some tips on how to make your clutter visible to you again and see your space with fresh eyes. Number one is to take pictures of your space. I've mentioned this in a ton of other videos and people chimed in in the comments saying, well, you know, I've tried that before and that actually really works. It's so simple, but so effective. When you look at a photo, you can see your space from a different perspective than from the perspective that you have when you're standing inside of that space. And so you notice things that you may have completely overlooked when you were in the room. The clutter almost pops forward in the pictures when it often blends to the background in person. Essentially, it's just a quick way to give yourself a different vantage point and to pull yourself out of the same perspective and the same space that you're in when the clutter is blind to you. Number two is to set regular intervals for decluttering. So in addition to building new neural pathways and strengthening your habits by doing things regularly, something that I talked about in this video on clutter-free tips from Atomic Habits, this practice also helps you to reset your brain's adaptation to clutter. It ensures that you're actively aware of what's accumulating because you're actively directing your attention to that space. Your attention is going to go wherever it's forced to go. It only allows things to fall to the background when you're not paying attention and you're not directly intentionally looking for things. So having a date on the calendar or some kind of a reminder or alarm is a great way to just periodically direct your attention to that area. Number three, change your environment. Rearranging furniture or just changing up the decor can jolt your brain into noticing things that it had previously filtered out because something's changed. It's not all status quo, filtered out, unimportant information anymore because something's different and therefore it's worth noticing. I once spoke at a widow's retreat and one of the most effective ways that these women shared for moving forward in a space that constantly reminded them of their lost partner was to simply rearrange the furniture. Something as simple as changing up the space made it feel different and they were able to release and move forward and not feel stuck in the same place. Begin rewiring by rearranging. 
Number four, mindful observation. Mindfulness and awareness are some of the top minimalist habits for good reason. Carl Jung once said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will drive your life and you will call it fate. That's a quote that I picked up from Atomic Habits that I chatted about recently. You might spend a few minutes each day scanning your environment. Make it a habit to notice details and to question whether items are necessary or if they're just taking up space. Speaking of atomic habits, Clear recommends pointing and calling, something that surgeons and surgical nurses do in the OR to reduce errors, but it can also be helpful for increasing mindfulness. Try announcing out loud when you splurge on products that you don't need or that you already have duplicates of, or when you don't put things away when you come home. Try just announcing, like, I'm not putting this away. I know that I'm going to have to do it later. I'm being lazy right now <laughs> and see if that changes your habits. That's recommended in the book. And the fifth thing you can do is just to invite feedback. Sometimes an outside perspective is all it takes, whether you're talking about your home or something else that's bothering you in life. Sometimes just talking to somebody else and getting a different perspective changes everything. So you can ask a friend or a family member to walk through your space and point out anything that seems like clutter to them. It may feel cringy, but better you to ask them than for them to tell you unprompted, right? Their fresh eyes may be able to see something that you've been missing. So understanding your brain's selective attention, how it works, why it's there, and all of these things can help to manage and reduce clutter more effectively. When you leverage techniques to bring your focus back to your environment, to kind of control the flow of your focus and of your attention and awareness, you can control your blindness too and hopefully break free of the clutter blindness to create more organized and serene spaces. Hopefully you found this helpful. If you have any ideas of your own that popped up, I would love to hear those down in the comments. We can kind of help each other out to bring light to our spaces. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and I'll chat with you next week.